are definitely living in the last days of Earth's history. And more and more people are believing that. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, but the very first verse of the first chapter says that the book of Revelation is about things which must shortly come to pass. In fact, that phrase is even repeated in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. And my friends, this is good news. Why? because it means that Jesus Christ is coming soon to take us home. And we here at the Paradise Church are committed to help people to be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Would you like to be ready? Well, that is why we're so glad you could join us today. And now let's see what God has for us from his word. I want to tell you the reason for this series I'm currently in. Here it is. The backdrop to this series, What is Armageddon?, revolves around this premise. If Satan prepared the Jews in advance to not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and what is he doing that we won't be ready for Jesus at his second coming? And part one, and so therefore, we have the series called What is Armageddon? Part one was the, the age of deception. Listen to this. The bulk, the majority of Christianity believe a deceptive hermeneutic. By the way, that's a really high fluting word meaning interpretation, the way you interpret the Bible. They believe a deceptive way to interpret the Bible that teaches the Antichrist is in the future. He's not here right now. And that the church will be raptured before the time of trouble. And that all means that for Christians today, they believe the book of Revelation is irrelevant to them. And in chapter 14 holds the most important message that's ever been preached because we're in the last days. It doesn't matter. And then the second part, who's the true Israel of God? Now, in the Old Testament, the plan of salvation was set forth in the Jewish economy and God reigned in the temple in Jerusalem. But today, in the New Testament, after Jesus' death and the withdrawal by God of his presence from the temple in Jerusalem, the church is now the dwelling place of God, not Jerusalem and Israel. Part three was, what is Armageddon? The gathering, or really unifying, of the whole world under the dictates of the unholy trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, by miracles to band them together against commandment-keeping remnant, resulting in a Sunday law followed by a death decree from which God delivers his people. Amen? Amen? And part four last week, we looked at when is Armageddon. Armageddon is introduced during the sixth plague. The plagues begin after the Sunday law and death decree are passed, and after the latter rain and the loud cry of Revelation 18 has been given, at that time probation closes, initiating, initiating the seven last plagues, and since there are only seven plagues, Armageddon occurs at the end just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now today we look at part five, where is Armageddon? I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Revelation, the, 
the 16th chapter. Revelation, the 16th chapter. And boys and girls, get your Bibles out and turn there to follow along. And remember, if there's a boy or girl without a Bible, see me after church. Last night, we gave out 20 Bibles. Yeah, that was great. Okay, what is Armageddon? Revelation 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth of the whole world to do what? To gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they are gathered together to a place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. First, let's look at what the title or name Armageddon means. Armageddon, this is the only place in the Bible that that word is found. Number one, or B, A. B is Har, Arm, Har, means mountain, So therefore, it would be mountain of Megiddo. But Megiddo means a place of slaughter or destruction. Therefore, Armageddon is the mountain of slaughter. See, Armageddon, there is no such place. Yes, there's a plain of Armageddon. Yes, it's mentioned in Joshua. It's mentioned in Judges. It's mentioned in Kings. It's mentioned in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. It's mentioned in Zechariah. You'll be seeing some of those texts in a second. But there's not a mountain called Megiddo. It's a plain. Therefore, the name, the Hebrew word Armageddon is symbolic, not literal. And D, Armageddon is an illusion to Megiddo, the plain of Megiddo, Judges 5, 19, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. Let's go to Judges. Take your Bibles, we're going to go to Judges. And I'll show you what this, the symbolic meaning of Armageddon is. Judges. This is a famous story you're all well aware of. You remember the story of Deborah and Barak? And Barak was hesitant to do what God wanted, so Deborah said, he said, if you go with me, I'll do it. I say that to my wife. And they had a great victory. So notice what it says in verse 1 through 3, then 19 through 23. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abimoam, saying on that day, saying. I'm reading the wrong place, aren't I? No, I... Am I right? When the leaders leaders led in Israel, the people willingly offered the blessing. Let's try four, one through three. Thank you. Four, Judges 4, 1 through 3, and then Judges 5, 19 through 23. When Ehu was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hatsor. 
the commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelled in Harshash Hagoim. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 iron chariots. And for 20 years, he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now, 519. 519. The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, and they took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their course fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, O oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping galloping of the steeds. Cursed Merzog, said the angel of the Lord. Cursed the inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. Okay, now let's look at this. This is amazing, folks, this story. So Deborah and Barak marched out with their small army against the gigantic army of Canaan. And I want you to notice that when they came together to fight on the plain of Megiddo, in verse 20 it says, they fought from the heavens, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Okay, now remember what we're doing. We're looking at where's Armageddon, okay? And so, Har Megiddo, mountain of Megiddo. What happened at Megiddo? First of all, there was a battle of the enemies of God came against his people. And the first thing that fought against them was what? Did you miss that? They fought them from heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Divine intervention by God and creation to defeat the enemies of God. Remember, we're looking for where is Armageddon. We're also getting another, interp not another, but a different interpreta interpretation of Armageddon. It's a battle in which God divinely intervenes. In fact, the next verse says, the torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of, of Kishon. Now, wait a minute. If you go and look at Megiddo, you will find the Kishon River, and it's not very big. And in the summer, it almost dries up. But look what it says here, the torrent of Kishon. And most of the expositors believe what that means is that God divinely sent a huge rainstorm that swollen the river, and that when the stars and the moon began to fight against them with Barak and, and Deborah, that they panicked and retreated, and when they tried to cross the river, they were swept away. Now, isn't this incredible? Because listen to this. Do you know that there's an example in history to this? The battle must have taken place in the winter or spring, for in the summer the Kishon runs low. This is really cool. The, the fate of Sisera's host finds a parallel in the battle of Mount Tabar between the armies of Napoleon and the Turks on April 16, 1799, when many of the Turks were drowned when attempting to escape across part of the plain inundated by the Kishon. Yes, amen. 
So I want you to notice that when we think of Megiddo, we are seeing how God fights for his people against a mighty army that comes against his people. In fact, in verse 21, it also says, O oh, my soul, march in strength. And I was surprised. I looked at that over and over, and then I realized, who was saying this? Look above Chapter 5, what does it say? The song of Deborah. Deborah's writing this. And Deborah's praying for Barak while he's fighting. And God is divinely intervening in his behalf. And a weak woman, folks, helped God defeat a powerful enemy. That's hope for all of us. And so when we look here at at Judges, where we find the story of the battle, we discover that this is why he's referring to Megiddo, so that when we look at Armageddon, we are looking at God divinely intervening at a time when, when the people of God think they're doomed by nature even itself fighting in their behalf. But there's one more thing here. By the way, I see a lot of people fanning themselves. Is it hot in here? Because I'm sweating. Oof. That makes it harder. Thank you. Look at verse uh, 23. Here's a caution for all of us. In the middle of this... Oh, by the way, verse 22. The horses, they were in such a panic to get away... They didn't shod their horses back then. The horses' hooves pounded so hard that they began to break. The feet began to crack. And the horses were now limping. And the army could barely, they could barely flee away so that um, Barak and his forces overcame them. And then it says, Curse Mirza, says the angel of the Lord, Curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord. Folks, Merzog is, a, is an Israelite city in which they refused to fight against the enemies of God. And they were cursed. And that's why we have to understand these things so that we end up on the right side. Listen, you've you got to stop and think. Let me just d deviate here. When I told you the, the deceptive hermeneutic that the vast majority of Christians are under, they believe the Antichrist is in the future. That means he's not here now. That means that they don't know who the real enemy is. Do you get that? And so when Jesus is ready to come, they don't know, they won't be ready because they don't know the truth just like the Jews didn't know the truth when Jesus came and they rejected him. So I'm really worried for us, folks. So let's take a quick look here. The king of Canaan and their armies came against Israel, God's people. The powers of heaven helped God's people win the battle. In verse 21, the thought implies that God sent a rainstorm. I already told you that. Verse 22, we talked about the prancing of the horses, the hoofs fail. And then Deborah, that weak woman, in the sense that she wasn't even fighting the battle, she was just praying, and had, by God's assistance, subdued the potent enemy, and then the Israelites who refused to participate were cursed. Well, take a look at this. There's one other, play, one other thing about uh, Megiddo. Second Chronicles. His servants therefore took him and they brought him to Jerusalem so that he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for King Josiah. In fact, Zechariah about that says, on that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great like the weeping of Hadarimon 
in the plain of Megiddo over the, the death of King Josiah. So Megiddo is a place of destruction of God's enemy and it's a place of mourning. Well, let's go on. And so what do the Christians think? The Christians believe that the battle is here on the plain of Megiddo. And that's where all of this is going to take place. Listen to just two examples. I thought this was interesting. It says here, I left home in the middle of leading a group of ladies through Pastor Swindoll's study on Revelation. Chuck Swindoll is a famous evangelical pastor. This lady is writing about her personal experience being brought to the plain of Megiddo. We had just finished reading chapter 19, hearing the reading of chapter 19 from the top of Tel Megiddo, overlooking the valley of Armageddon below with Mount Carmel, Mount Tabor, Nazareth, the hill of Mora, and Mount Gilboa in the distance gave me a whole new perspective of what's to come. It is here where the armies of the world will gather in battle, and I could envision God's army dressed in robes and riding white horses as the Lord defeats the armies of the world on, with a sharp sword in his mouth. King of kings and Lord of lords. This lady is being taught that the final battle will be right there. It'll be over Jerusalem. And all the world will come and God will defeat them. Now remember something. When God returns, what will we know for sure he will not do? He won't touch the earth. Yeah. He won't touch the earth. But they got the enemy being defeated there on that plain by God. But listen to a different, here's a different rendition, same idea. I'll read this to you. I found all this stuff. It's amazing. So it is in Jerusalem that the battle of the great God Almighty is fought. The sweeping valley that is today called Kidron between the old city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be the focal point. Christ will descend with a spirit army and tread the wine presses of the wrath, Revelation 19. Revelation 14, 20 indicates the blood of the carnage will run several feet deep. It will indeed be a great battle. The final battle will end in peace of the kingdom of God. Megiddo and the Jezreel Valley provide an ideal staging point for this battle. We can imagine the forces flowing through the port of Hafstra, Hafa, a few miles to the northwest on the Mediterranean there, you can see on the map. Transport planes, helicopters, troop carriers, tanks will ferry men and materials into the region. Jet fighters and missiles will no doubt be engaged in a battle that suddenly turns the attention to the forces coming from the unexpected location, the heavens above Jerusalem in their fo folly and deception, they will fight Christ, never recognizing him as the Messiah. <clears throat> Is this true? Where do they get this stuff? Let me show you where they get it, and then we'll answer it. All eyes are on Jerusalem in the Christian world. And, and here's, some, here's some hints why. Zechariah. Tell us more details. Zechariah uh, 14 tells us more details of what this will be. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoils will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the days of the battle. Oh, okay, it says Jerusalem, doesn't it? But folks, 
This is what would have happened if Jerusalem had accepted the Savior. But they didn't. And now these promises pass to the church. So they use the backdrop of Jerusalem and Israel, the Middle East, in order for us to understand that this is what will happen to the church. And notice, I don't know if any of you... <laughs> How are you going to fit all the armies of the world in that little spot? Listen, all we have to do is send one Adam Bob. But the staging center and the and Megiddo and planes and tanks, and, this is ridiculous. They really believe it's a literal battle. And folks, it's a spiritual battle. I'm getting to it. I will also gather, this is Joel, I will gather all the nations. Can you see all the nations? Zechariah says all the nations. You know, in this map, do you see the southern part of Africa? Do you see South America? Do you see the United States? Do you see Canada? Do you see the eastern part of the world? No. But our Bible says all nations. Remember? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet work miracles in order to gather the whole world against God's commandment-keeping people, not Israel. They rejected the Messiah. And the Antichrist is already here because he's the one that changed the seal of God from Saturday to Sunday. That's who the enemy is. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet. And, and so therefore, read Joel, it says the same thing. They'll enter into judgment with them on account of my people, my inheritance, Israel. And then they will scatter among all the nations and they will have also divided up. Wow. Okay. I think I got to... This is really fun preparing for, but trying to give it to you in a half hour. Huh. Folks, they also get it from Ezekiel 38 and 39. Go ahead and read it. In 38 and 39, it says, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Where's Gog? There is no such place as Gog. But, but they give it locations in their interpretation. This represents all the wicked people. Of the land of Magog, which is a multitude of God, the prince of Rush, and they say, oh, Rush is Russia, and there is no biblical evidence or support for that. Tubo, Meshach, and the prophecy against him. And then verse 14, and therefore the Son of Man prophesy and say to Gog, then you will come from your place, from the far north. And remember what I taught you? The north represents judgment. So the world churches, or the world nations are going to come against God's people for the purpose to kill them. I'll, I'll show you this in a second. They're not coming to Jerusalem because that's not where God's people are. There are some there that are God's people, but they're everywhere now, folks. They're the whole world over. Then you will come from your place out of the far north. Yes, you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, great company and mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. And as God divinely um, delivered the Israelites in their battle with the Canaanites, so will our God deliver us when they come against us because we keep the commandments of God and they change the law. 
And so it says, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I will have spoken. Surely the days there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. When will the earthquake occur? The great earthquake. During the seventh last plague. That's right. In fact, check this out. We went over that last week. The seventh plague. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of heaven, the beasts of the field, all the creepy things that creep on the earth, all the men who are in the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, fall on us, and, and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. The mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every war, wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for the sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, plural, not just one, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. You know what that means? There are two places in the Bible where battles were fought in which the Israelites didn't do anything and the enemy killed each other. Do you know which one? Gideon, his 300 blew the trumpet, and what did the enemy do? Kill each other. And the other is Jehoshaphat. His choir was marching with the army behind singing, and while they were doing it, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir turned on each other and killed each other. And I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many people who are with him. Flooding rain, great hail, fire, brimstone, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the fourth plague. Check this out. So where is Armageddon? Everywhere God's people are hiding and waiting for the coming of Jesus to his deliverance and his return. The worldwide is where Armageddon is. You don't believe me? Check this out. When the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for their destruction. Destruction of who? The people who keep the law of God. Of God. As the time appointed in the decree, what decree? The death decree. Get this. As the time appointed in the death decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow which shall utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forest and in the mountains, still pleading for divine protection, while in every quarter company of armed men urged on by host of evil angels are preparing for the work of death, it is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of his chosen people. The sixth plague. The river Euphrates dries up. How? By a divine intervention of God who isn't even there yet. Jesus hasn't even started coming yet. I'm not done. With shouts of triumph, jeers, and imprecations, that means swearing. Throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. The death decree time came up. When I used to go deer hunting, I sat there like this because you weren't allowed to shoot until... The sun was up, and we'd hear rustling, and we'd be sitting in our blinds, and we had to wait, we had to wait, and the minute the time struck, meaning the sun rose, we could attack. The same when the sun went down, by the way. 
If you hadn't gotten anything all day long, man, you're desperate, you hear something, you're on the thing, and oh no, the sun's going to go down. When the sun goes down, you're not allowed to shoot. Throngs of evil men are about to rush upon the prey when, lo, a dense dark, deeper than the darkness of night, falls upon the earth. Then a rainbow shining in the glory from the throne of God spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. The angry multitude are suddenly arrested their mocking cries die away. The object of their murderous rage are forgotten. With fearful foreboding, they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from the overpowering brightness. Come on, I just got chills. At that very moment when we're sure we're goners, God will divinely intervene. How does he do it? By coming on white horses with an army and landing and killing them all with swords? No. By the way, the sword comes out of his mouth, folks. He does it by sending a rainbow around every praying group. The minute he does that, the sixth plague, they realize they were wrong and then when you go on and keep reading in Great Controversy, it says, then they hear a voice say, it is done. That is the seventh plague. Then Jesus appears in the sky. But the people have already started turning on one another to kill each other because especially the preachers that misled them. Where's Armageddon? Worldwide. It's wherever there's a company of praying saints. It's not Jerusalem. But there will be praying saints in Jerusalem. And God will deliver them wherever they are. Isn't this incredible? And folks, they all believe that it's in the future it's over there in Israel. They're not ready for the second coming. This is scary. Just for a review with you, I want to review the seventh plague. We read it in Ezekiel. Now we read it in the great controversy. The seventh plague is the voice, it is done, a great earthquake. Babylon sp splits in three. Remember? Armageddon is the gathering together of the forces by the unholy three, and they become one. Babylon the Great, mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. But when the, when the sixth plague comes, and God delivers his people by rainbows around the praying company, they suddenly realize they were wrong. And then a voice we hear while they're running in panic and some of them are chasing the preachers to kill them. There's, they hear a voice, we hear a voice, it is done. Then there's a great earthquake. It says every island shall fled away and the mountains cannot be found. Huge hailstones. That's exactly what we read in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And then... Jesus comes, and in Revelation 19, he is described as coming on a white horse with an army. But he's not coming to fight that battle. He's coming to get his people. So where's Armageddon? Now you know. Armageddon is worldwide, and next week we're going to look at who is the true man of sin. Father, I want to thank you for blessing our meeting today. And Lord, only you know how complex this is if you're just sitting there for the first time and hearing all this information. But it's all in there in Daniel, Revelation, the great controversy. 
And now you expect your people to understand so we can reach out to others so they can know too. Help us to be faithful. And if there's anybody here who doesn't have the great controversy, Father, have them see me so we can get them a copy. Now don't let anybody here be afraid, Lord. For we see how you delivered your people throughout history. And in some of the battles, they didn't even fight. And so we can trust you, just like I had to trust you at the children's story. Make us people of the book, Lord. People of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I hope you enjoyed the biblical presentation that you just experienced. It's our intention here at the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church of making the Bible, God's Word, the center of our lives. And we invite you to do the very same thing. For there's nothing more powerful or important in these last days than the Word of God. So thank you for joining us today. And if you're ever in the neighborhood, we invite you to come and to join us for worship on any Sabbath. May God richly bless you and your family.